For those of you, maybe you're visiting today for the first time, we're in 1 Corinthians. So if you'd open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, we're going to be in the first 11, cha- uh, first 11 verses of chapter 6. We are not going over 11 chapters. So I saw some of you panic. The first 11 verses in chapter 6. The Apostle Paul, thank you, Joni, the Apostle Paul continues to address spiritual immaturity that is plaguing the Corinthians church. And because of that, we're going to get more of the same this morning. He's been writing for some time now. I would imagine he has to be exhausted. Correcting the Corinthians where they have strayed from biblical living. At this time, I wonder what the climate of the Corinthian church was. Were they cringing? Were they nervous? Were they mad at Paul? Were they defiant? Were they wondering, is he going to start naming names? Maybe they were apathetic. Maybe they, who really cares what Paul thinks? I mean, we haven't seen that guy in years. I wonder right now, what is the climate of your heart? Are you apathetic? Are you cringing? Maybe you're cringing at your own sin. Are you mad? Do you get angry when your sin gets pointed out? Who likes to receive correction? I mean, there's value in receiving correction, but nobody, nobody ever gets really excited about it. Are you apathetic about your own sin? Is your heart impatient? Are you dissatisfied with God's plan for your life? Your current trajectory, are you dissatisfied with that? Are you dissatisfied with the current state of Grace Church? Are we ever going to hire a lead pastor? I'm sick of Pote's sermons. Has your heart lost focus this morning? No one said amen after that. I really appreciate that. (laughs) You've been called. Thank you, Luke. You've been called. We have a calling. We can lose focus from that calling. It's true, we've been called to salvation. Each one of us, God has called us to salvation. Some of us have answered that, some have not. But that's just the beginning because you've been called to a movement. You've been called to a purpose. Not just a label. Not just the state of being saved, but that's just the beginning. You've been called to a lifetime of growth. And when we lose focus, we become like the Corinthian church and the movement grinds to a halt. Satan rubs his hands together with glee Because if he can distract us from the movement, then he's won. He's stalled the work that God has planned here in Delta County. If he can distract the church, if he can distract you from the movement, that which you've been called to, then he has the upper hand. So let us this morning receive correction from God's word with humility for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the movement. You should already be in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 11. I'm going to invite you to your feet as we show respect for God's word this morning. If you are able to stand, please do so. If you're uncomfortable standing, please remain seated. But it's my prayer that we would always show respect for God's word. Verse 1, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Verse 2, or do you know... Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that when that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough? to settle a dispute between the brothers. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat to you. 
Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Verse 8, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we want to take a moment right now and commit our hearts to submission. We submit to your word. Give us the courage to do that. Give us the courage to let go of what we think we have a right to, to let go of our pride, to let go even of our own understanding. But I pray that we would submit to your word this morning. Give us the strength, courage, and humility to do that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Number one, lawsuits against believers. Paul must have been shaking his head. The next eight verses illustrate a huge lack of focus on the mission we are called to. There were members of the Corinthian church that were so divided that they were actually suing each other in open court. Look around this room. Imagine who, how something could go so wrong in a relationship in this room that you could take that person to open court. That you could say, we can't figure this out. You've got to do it for us. Imagine that. You might say, there's no way that we could ever be that dysfunctional. How could it go that far? Well, don't flatter yourself this morning. Because once you get distracted from the mission, there's really no limit to what can happen. There are a couple problems here. The first we've touched on. They are so divided that they're suing each other. Satan is high-fiving demons at this point. The second problem is there's no one mature enough to help them solve the problem. They've been a church for however long, but no one's growing. No one has grown up enough to step in and say, this is what the word of God says about your dispute. There's no one there in that context that is mature enough. No one is available to help these parties reach a biblical resolution that honors God. When one of you has a grievance, we're in verse 1, against one another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, you and I will reign with Christ one day. And we will judge the world. We will even judge angels. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than the matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Verse 5, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? Paul says you're equipped to handle this. You've been given everything that you need to figure out this dispute. As believers, we have bigger fish to fry. We are called to, we're called to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. That's priority number one for the church. Which means the Corinthian church, isn't, they're not doing that because they're fighting each other. We will rule with Christ one day, but today is not that day. Apparently, these Corinthian church members could not solve their own problems, so they had to take it to a secular court. Why is that? Immaturity. No one is willing 
to humble themselves to their brother. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6 should be up on the screen. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. So the all of you is applying both to the elders and the younger. The all of you is applying to everyone in this room. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we're talking about people on two different sides of an issue. God's above the issue, and he says, the proud one, that's who I oppose. So you may think you're right, and maybe you are right. But if you're proud, God opposes you. Think about that. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Humble yourselves to the people around you who have the maturity to help you solve your problems. They have the answers. There are two ingredients to working through problems in the church. The first is humility. And the second is faith. Humility means a willingness to recognize that you don't have all the answers. A willingness to submit to someone else who does have the answer. The second part is faith. Trusting that God is just, that he will make it right, and whatever the conflict is, God will make it right. That means before you put your dukes up, you say, I need to humble myself, and I need to trust that God will make this right. That's a promise from Scripture. We can have faith that God will make it right. Look at 1 Peter 5, 6 one more time. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. You may be vindicated in your argument. In your difficulty, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's at work, maybe it's with someone in this room. If you humble yourself before God, in this life or the next, God will exalt you. But not because you won the fight, because you humbled yourself before God. So, Grace Church members and regular attenders, can I pull back the curtain for you? And show you what happened behind the scenes this week in our leadership team. Right now, our leadership team exists of six people. The lay elders, Darren Lung, Scott Randall, and Don Pyle. The three pastors, Pastor Jason, Pastor Dave, and yours truly. That group consists of six individuals with different experiences, different personalities. We don't always see eye to eye. Sometimes we have disagreements. Sometimes we interpret things differently. And it happened this week. We were on different sides of the issue. And you know what we did? We called our lawyers. No, we didn't do that. The six of us got into a room and we sat down and we talked it out. We talked we listened, we trusted each other, we trusted God, and when we walked out of that room, we were all on the same page. We were all in complete agreement. You know what a side benefit of that is? Our love and respect and trust for one another grew. So how did we do it? Several factors. One, each person was humble. We listened. We debated respectfully. We didn't interrupt each other. And when we did, we apologized. Number two, we had faith that God would work out the conflict. God is sovereign. God, his plan cannot be thwarted. Number three, we kept mission focus. Being right did not trump the most important thing. And our mission as a leadership team is to do what is best, biblically speaking, for Grace Church. We may have disagreed 
on what the best course of action is, but our goal, all six of us in that room, is the same. And you know what happened? When each side was heard, we left that room on the same page. The loudest guy did not win. The smartest guy did not win. The most ruthless guy did not win. Jesus won. The church won. And that is the goal. That's the goal. In verse 7, Paul says, it's better for you to be ripped off. It's better for you to be defrauded. It's better for you to be cheated and disrespected than for you to fight and win at all costs in the church, in your marriage, in your relationships, in the workplace. If you are a person who must get their way all the time, the Apostle Paul is talking to you right now. And he says, shame on you. It's better for you to be defrauded than to harm the body of Christ and our reputation in this community. Every once in a while, I'm working on a vehicle or something and, and my body fails me, right? I remember a couple years ago, I was underneath my truck. I've always had tremendous vision. I've always been able to see really well. And I'm working on my truck and I'm like right here. And I feel myself, I keep trying to back my head up. Like, I keep trying to push into the bottom of my garage floor. Why? Because my eyeballs were too close to what I was working on. You know, some of, I see some more senior advanced members of our congregation, and they got a long arm, their cell phone, you know, so they can, they can read it, or they read their Bible like this, or they learn how to hold it with their toes, so they can see it, right? I'm underneath my truck, trying to see this bolt and get it, you know, get the socket on there right, and I can't. I keep moving my head back. I'm frustrated. Then it dawns on me. My eyes are letting me down. Should I punish them? Yeah, you laugh. That doesn't make sense. Well, who's going to suffer if I punish my eyes? And yet, we look at our spouse and say, I'm going to punish them because they're wrong. We look at other people in this body of Christ. We're all members of the same body. I'm not going to fight so hard to win that I damage you. I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to say, God will sort it out. God will sort it out. That needs to be our approach to conflict in the church. We need to do our job biblically. But we need to have faith that God will help us all reach a biblical conclusion. Paul says, stop fighting, humble yourselves, and trust that God will make it right. Number two, the unrighteous. Paul says, how can you take your case to unbelievers? He says that you'll judge angels. You are competent to judge angels. You are equipped to judge the angels. You one day will rule with Christ and judge the world. But you take your problems to a secular court? Look at verse 9 and 10. Or do you not know that the righteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. They've got bigger problems. Your biggest problem is solved because you've put your faith in Christ. No matter what else happens, if you lose every fight or debate or issue that you're wrapped up in right now. It doesn't matter. You will rule with Christ one day. You'll spend eternity with him. These people that you're going to to solve their problems will not. And another thing, it's your job to win the lost people. If we air the church's dirty laundry to the world, that job gets a lot harder. I'm not saying we hide things. I'm not saying we run away from our problems or sweep them, them under the rug. But what I am saying is we don't need to take it to the world for answers. You remember Pastor Dave's sermon last week? He talked about expelling the immoral, unrepentant believer. Why? Because they're not willing to humble themselves. 
not willing to submit to biblical authority. Either one of two things is happening. Either they're not truly believers, and the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in them, or they have slammed on the brakes so many times and told the Holy Spirit no, that he stopped trying to influence them. Either way, they are unable to come to a biblical conclusion to their problems. These people who have not submitted their lives to Christ, who do not have the Holy Spirit in them, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. They are your mission field. They are not the solution to your problems. We cannot take our dirty laundry to the people around us. We have lost focus and the mission is failing. Number three, and such were some of you. You can help them with their problems because you've been there and Jesus solved your problems for you. You have the answer. But that statement, and such were some of you, should be pretty humbling for us. Because we didn't solve our own problem. Jesus did. Each one of us stands before Christ, and we should humble ourselves. Verse 11 is a sermon all in itself. There is so much theological truth packed in to this one verse. I wish I had another 30 minutes to preach a sermon through just this one verse but I don't. So we're going to fly through it. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were lost. I was lost. We were all lost, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. There are three transactions taking place here, and they cost Jesus everything. First, you were washed. Jesus came and he cleansed you of your sin and guilt. Jesus took you and he set you apart. That's what sanctification means. Jesus took you and he set you apart for a specific purpose, a specific calling, a specific mission. That's what we've been talking about this whole sermon. You have been cleansed of your sin. You were set apart to do something. Not just to be something, but to do something. That's to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. Being a Christian just isn't a label. It's a job description. It's a mission. It's not just holy fire insurance. Your salvation is just the beginning. You are here to grow. I am here to grow. You are to be mission ready all the time. That's what it means to be sanctified. You are set apart for a purpose. So you are washed of your guilt and sin. You are set apart to do a job. And finally, the last thing Paul talks about in that verse is you are declared holy and innocent before God. That's what justification means. Justification means that when God the Father looks at you, he views you through a lens of the righteousness of Christ. That's what justification means. Right now, as God the Father looks at you, you are justified. You have the righteousness of of Christ. And Paul is saying, live like it. Live like it. Lay down your pride. Stop fighting to get your way. Focus on your calling. Pick up humility. Pick up faith. Trust that Jesus will make it all right in the end. And when Satan tries to distract you, he will fail. The mission will go forward. If he does distract you, If you're not mission ready, then he's won. He wins because you're not on mission. Ultimately, we can go to the back of the Bible, read the end of the story. We know that ultimately, Satan will not win. Jesus will be victorious. But you know what? He can be winning in your heart right now, today. So I say this in love. Grow up. 
I say that to myself. Grow up. Spiritually speaking, we all need to grow up. We trip over conflict so many times. Well, I'm right. I can't help it that I'm right. Paul says, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded than harm the body of Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Today is a difficult sermon. It's difficult for me because I like to be right. I'm always good for a fight, for an argument. I repent of that this morning. I pray that we would all repent of that. That we would humble ourselves before your mighty throne. That we would trust that you will make it right. That you will make a way for the mission to go forward. Help us to do our part, I pray. We thank you for the cross of Christ. We thank you for making us his bride. I pray that we wouldn't fight amongst ourselves, but that we would fight for the cause of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.